I thought it might help to, to start out by giving a, a little background on myself. As Sarah mentioned, I'm a sociologist, uh, but I'm a little unusual for a sociologist in that I actually started out life as a physicist uh, way back uh, in 19, the early 1990s uh, in Australia, and I wrote my undergraduate thesis on uh, what was a very hot topic then called chaos theory. A couple of years later, I moved to the US uh, and did my uh, PhD in uh, an engineering department uh, up, up at Cornell University, a few hours upstate from here. Uh, and wrote my dissertation there on, on what was then becoming a, a new sort of hot topic of, of, uh, of social networks. So inspired by that work, I decided to, to then move into sociology. And so uh, after a few stints at, uh, at the Santa Fe Institute and at MIT, I ended up teaching sociology for seven years uh, just up the street at Columbia. And then just as I started to feel comfortable calling myself a sociologist, I switched tracks yet again, and now I work at Yahoo in our, in our research lab there, where I work almost exclusively with computer scientists. And so the reason why I'm telling you this is that all this sort of toing and froing uh, between uh, physics and sociology and computer science has really led me to think a lot about like what is social science and what is it that sociologists do? And in particular, why is it that the kinds of problems that sociologists work on seem different from the kinds of problems that other scientists work on? And just to make this concrete, if you go back and remember the kinds of courses that you might have taken uh, as an undergraduate in, in uh, political science or sociology or psychology, uh, you might have found these questions interesting, but I'm guessing that you didn't find them hard in the same way that you found the problems in your physics class hard or your chemistry class or even your biology class. And you know, this sort of sense of things not seeming hard in the social world is really sort of encapsulated by this phrase that we often sort of toss off when, when we're, we're arguing about something and we're, we're having trouble finding a solution. And we say, listen, people, you know, you know, we should be able to think this through. This is not rocket science. And I find this phrase deeply puzzling because the evidence is that we're actually much, much better at rocket science than we are about uh, problems to do with human behavior. So, you know, when NASA sends a, a satellite to orbit Jupiter, you know, it, it really goes where it's supposed to go, and it does what it's supposed to do. Meanwhile, back here on Earth, 100 years after John Wanamaker famously said, you know, half the money I spent on advertising is wasted, I just don't know which half, advertisers still have trouble uh, measuring the effectiveness of the campaigns they create. Uh, you know, a couple of hundred, a few hundred years after the birth of modern democracy, we still have trouble uh, designing and measuring the effectiveness of, of social and economic policies. Uh, you know, a couple of hundred years of economic and political theory have gone by and we still can't predict the next financial or political crisis. Uh, you know, uh, after several decades of economic development in the developing world, uh, it's still notoriously hard to, to design or measure uh, the effectiveness of development programs, you know, and so on and so forth. Predicting uh, hit books, uh, movies, companies, you know, thousands of years of teaching our kids and we still argue about how we should be doing it. So you might be thinking, well, you know, there's very good reasons why these problems are, are, are harder than rocket science, and I think that you're absolutely right. But then the puzzle is, why does rocket science seem hard and social science seem like just a matter of common sense? And the answer I want to propose and what I'm talking about in this book is that it has to do with common sense itself. Now, common sense is interesting uh, because for something we bandy about so much and talk about so much, it's notoriously hard to pin down. What I mean by common sense is the sort of form of human intelligence that we rely on mostly implicitly to navigate concrete everyday situations. So looking out in the audience today, I noticed that no one has shown up in their beach wear today. And, uh, but I'm guessing that when you were getting dressed this morning, there wasn't sort of this immense challenge that you had to go through figuring out what kinds of clothes to put on because, you know, it's just a matter of common sense. You just know uh, what you're supposed to do. Uh, the same, uh, for the same reason, you know, the way I'm speaking to you now is actually quite different from how you'll speak to each other during the break or how you'll speak to your kids when you get home at night or how you'll talk to your friends when you're, uh, when you're out with them next. Uh, and again, there's sort of these subtle manipulations of tone and, 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 and volume are, are things that come implicitly to us because they're just common sense. Coming here this morning, you were following all kinds of rules about how to get in the subway and how to, you know, to stand next to people and how to be polite. Uh, and you don't think about uh, why you know these things because they're all just common sense. So common sense is this sort of uh, fantastic piece of human intelligence that helps us navigate everyday situations. So what's the problem? Well, the problem with common sense is that we're so impressed by it uh, and it's so useful to us that we use it to solve all these other kinds of problems that I was just mentioning that are in fact not like concrete everyday situations. 
In fact, they're at the opposite end of the spectrum. They all involve uh, large numbers of people interacting with each other in complex ways over wide uh, 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 extended periods of time. And when we think about problems like these, there's no reason to think that the kind of common sense that works well on an everyday basis should be good at reasoning through these situations. And in fact, it isn't. Now, this is a problem that sociologists have been worried about for a long time. And in fact, back in 1947, you know, over 60 years ago, Paul Lazarsfeld, the American sociologist, wrote this very interesting review of a vast study called The American Soldier, which was commissioned by the US War Department uh, sociologists went in and interviewed about 600,000 soldiers and asked them about their life in the army and they had just published the results in this, in this book. And Lazarsfeld goes through a few of these results and he says, you know, one of them was that men from rural backgrounds fared better than men from cities. Now Lazarsfeld then steps back from his review and imagines the reader's reaction. And the reader says, oh, you know, that's kind of obvious. Of course men from rural backgrounds did better than men from cities. Men from rural backgrounds are used to, you know, hard living, they're used to sleeping on the ground, they're used to long hours, getting up with the sun, and so on. So, you know, why do they need such a vast and expensive study to tell me what I could have figured out using my own common sense? And Lazarsfeld says, good point. Except, the results that I told you were all the opposite of the results that the study actually found. In fact, it was city men who did better than rural men. Now, if he told you that answer to begin with, that would also have seemed obvious for other reasons. You'd say, well, of course city men did better. They're used to working in large, vertically integrated organizations. They're used to showing up in business attire. Uh, you know, they're, they're used to discipline and, and rigid hours. You know, again, uh, that seems obvious to me. Lazarsfeld says, exactly. When every conclusion and its opposite appear equally obvious, once you know the answer, there is a problem with the concept of obviousness itself. Now, what I, the point I want to make here is that Lazarsfeld observation is really true for everything in, in the social life, in, in social life. If we look at what's going on in the financial crisis in Europe now, it seems tremendously complex. There are lots of, of relevant, potentially relevant factors and lots of potential outcomes that we can imagine. But if we look back at the last financial crisis, we see a very different picture. We know how it ended, and so we can sort through all of the potentially relevant things, and we can pick out the ones that we now know uh, or seem to have been relevant. You know, the, the housing boom, the uh, CDOs, uh, uh, the mortgage lending practices. It seems obvious to, now that, to us now that these are the things we should have been paying attention to, and we seem to, we always tell ourselves, if we, only we'd known uh, that that was the thing to pay attention to, we could have predicted the outcome. But this is very deceptive because, first of all, we can always do this no matter what the outcome is. That's Lazarsfeld's point. And secondly, we can only do it when we know the outcome, once we know the answer. Okay, so, the re so what all this boils down to is that the things that we call explanations, the things that we read in the newspaper every day, are not really explanations at all in the scientific sense that they can predict things, they're really just stories. They tell us what happened, but not why it happened. So, you know, why is this bad? Well, it's not always bad. Stories are, are great and they serve many useful purposes. But again, just like common sense, they're so persuasive to us that we want to take the stories that we tell about the past and we want to generalize them to make predictions about the future. And this is where we get into trouble. And the fact that we want to do this is embedded uh, in uh, George Santayana's famous quote that those who do not learn from history are condemned to repeat it. So this is something we want to do. In fact, it can work. And again, common sense works very well because we get to experience the same kinds of things over and over again. And so we really can learn cause and effect. But the whole point about complex systems is that history never really repeats. And we sort of think that, you know, that we can learn something from the last financial crisis to predict the next financial crisis. But in fact, they're always different uh, in, in subtle but important ways. And as a result, when we try to intervene in these complex systems, we run into uh, what Robert Merton called the law of unintended consequences. Okay, so what are we supposed to do? People often get depressed about this stage of the talk. They think, you know, you know you're telling me that nothing that I think is, is reliable anymore. Uh, but, you know, the good news is that there are ways to augment common sense reasoning that can help. And the model that I want to point to here is really the scientific method, which over the last few hundred years has done a tremendous job in helping us figure out uh, things about the natural and the physical world that were not intuitive to us to begin with. And the, what I want to claim is that policy and strategy and marketing and other areas of business and economic and social life can benefit from the same kind of approach. Now, there's a huge challenge here because the kinds of problems that I'm talking about, once again, involve large numbers of people interacting over time. And historically, this sort of thing has been impossible to measure. Now, 
it's very hard to do science when you can't measure things. And so what has been so exciting about the last 10 years and the kind of work that I've been able to do uh, for the last decade is that thanks to the internet and the web and uh, social media sites and SMS and so on, it is actually starting to become possible to measure the unmeasurable, to make the, the previously th uh, invisible visible. And I think that in the same way uh, that you know, the telescope revolutionized uh, physical science, uh, we will start to see uh, the revolution of social science. So it's probably true that even with all this data, social sociology uh, is never really going to turn into something like physics or, or even medical science, and I'm not making that claim. But I do think that this revolution, which is already happening in social science, is going to be transformative, not just in science, but also in business practice and maybe even policy development. So thank you very much.